Nihilism, The Root of the Revolution of the Modern Age, by Eugene Father Seraphim Rose. Part 6. Chapter 4. The Nihilist Program. War against God, issuing in the proclamation of the reign of nothingness, which means the triumph of incoherence and absurdity, the whole plan presided over by Satan. This, in brief, is the theology and the meaning of nihilism. But man cannot live by such blatant negation. Unlike Satan, he cannot even desire it for his own sake, but only by mistaking it for something positive and good. And in fact, no nihilist, apart from a few moments of frenzy and enthusiasm, or perhaps despair, has ever seen his negation as anything but the means to a higher goal. Nihilism furthers its satanic ends by means of a positive program. The most violent revolutionaries, a Nikayev or Bakunin, a Lenin or Hitler, and even the demented practitioners of the quote, propaganda of the deed, dreamed of the quote, new order, their violent destructions of the old order would make possible. Dada and, quote, anti-literature seek not the total destruction of art, but the path to a, quote, new art. The passive nihilist, in his, quote, existential apathy and despair, sustains life only by the vague hope that he may yet find some kind of ultimate satisfaction in a world that seems to deny it. The content of the nihilist dream is, then, a, quote, positive one. But truth requires that we view it in proper perspective, not through those rose-colored spectacles of the nihilist himself, but in the realistic manner our century's intimate acquaintance with nihilism permits. Armed with knowledge this acquaintance affords, and with the Christian truth which enables us to interpret it aright, we shall attempt to look behind the nihilist phrases to see the realities they conceal. Seen in this perspective, the very phrases which to the nihilist seem entirely, quote, positive, appear to the orthodox Christian in another light, as items in a program quite different from that of nihilist apologetics. 1. The Destruction of the Old Order the first and most obvious item in the program of nihilism is the destruction of the old order. The old order was the soil, nourished by Christian truth, in which men had their roots. Its laws and institutions, and even its customs, were founded in that truth and dedicated to teaching it. Its buildings were erected to the glory of God, and were a visible sign of his order upon earth. Even the generally, quote, primitive, but natural, living conditions served, unintentionally of course, as a reminder of man's humble place here, of his dependence upon God for even the few earthly blessings he possessed, and of his true home which lies beyond this, quote, veil of tears in the kingdom of heaven. Effective war against God and his truth requires the destruction of every element of this old order. It is here that the peculiarly nihilist, quote, virtue of violence comes into play. Violence is no merely incidental aspect of the nihilist revolution, but a part of its essence. According to Marxist, quote, dogma, quote, Force is the midwife of every old society pregnant with a new one, end quote. Appeals to violence, and even a kind of ecstasy at the prospect of its use, abound in revolutionary literature. Bakunin invoked the, quote, evil passions, and called for the unchaining of the, quote, popular anarchy, in the cause of, quote, universal destruction, and his, quote, revolutionary catechism is the primer of ruthless violence. Marx was fervent in his advocacy of, quote, revolutionary terror, 
as the one means of hastening the advent of communism. Lenin defined the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, the stage in which the Soviet Union still finds itself, as a, quote, domination that is untrammeled by law and based on violence, end quote. Demagogic incitement of the masses and the arousing of the basest passions for revolutionary purposes have long been standard nihilist practice. The spirit of violence has been most thoroughly incarnated in our century by the nihilist regimes of Bolshevism and National Socialism. It is to these that there have been assigned the principal roles and the nihilist task of destruction of the old order. The two, whatever their psychological dissimilarities and the historical, quote, accidents which placed them in opposing camps, have been partners in their frenzied accomplishment of this task. Bolshevism, to be sure, has had the more, quote, positive role of the two, since it has been able to justify its monstrous crimes by an appeal to a pseudo-Christian messianic idealism which Hitler scorned. Hitler's role in the nihilist program was more specialized and provincial, but nonetheless essential. Even in failure, in fact, precisely in the failure of its ostensible aims, Nazism served the cause of this program quite apart from the political and ideological benefits which the Nazi interlude in European history gave to the communist powers. Communism, it is now widely and erroneously believed, if evil in itself, still cannot be as evil as Nazism. Nazism had another, more obvious and direct, function. Goebbels explained this function in his radio broadcasts in the last days of the war. The bomb terror spares the dwellings of neither rich nor poor. Before the labor offices of total war, the last class barriers have had to go down. Together with the monuments of culture, there crumble also the last obstacles to the fulfillment of our revolutionary task. Now that everything is in ruins, we are forced to rebuild Europe. In the past, private possessions tied us to a bourgeois restraint. Now the bombs, instead of killing all Europeans, have only smashed the prison walls which kept them captive. In trying to destroy Europe's future, the enemy has only succeeded in smashing its past. And with that, everything old and outworn has gone. Nazism thus, and its war, have done for Central Europe, and less thoroughly for Western Europe, what Bolshevism did in its revolution for Russia, destroyed the old order, and thus cleared the way for the building of the, quote, new. Bolshevism, then, had no difficulty in taking over where Nazism had left off. Within a few years, the whole of Central Europe had passed under the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, i.e. Bolshevist tyranny, for which Nazism had effectively prepared the way. The nihilism of Hitler was too pure, too unbalanced, to have more than a negative preliminary role to play in the whole nihilist program. Its role, like the role of the purely negative first phase of Bolshevism, is now finished and the next stage belongs to a power possessing a more complete view of the whole revolution. The Soviet power upon which Hitler bestowed, in effect, his inheritance in the words, quote, the future belongs solely to the stronger Eastern nation, end quote. Two, the making of the, quote, new earth. But we do not yet have to do with the ultimate future, with the end of the revolution. Between the revolution of destruction and the earthly paradise, there lies a stage of transition, known in Marxist doctrine as the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote. In this stage, we may see a second, quote, constructive, 
function of violence. The nihilist Soviet power has been the most ruthless and systematic in developing this stage, but precisely the same work is being accomplished by the realists of the free world, who have been quite successful in transforming and, quote, simplifying the Christian tradition into a system for the promotion of worldly, quote, progress. The ideal of Soviet and Western realists is an identical one. Pursued by the former with single-minded fervor, by the latter more spontaneously and sporadically, not always directed by governments, but with their encouragement, relying more upon individual initiative and ambition. Realists everywhere envisage a totally, quote, new order, built entirely by men, quote, liberated from the yoke of God and upon the ruins of an old order whose foundation was divine. The revolution of nihilism, willed or unwilled, is accepted, and through the labor of workers in all realms, on both sides of the, quote, iron curtain, a new, purely human kingdom is arising, in which its apologists see a, quote, new earth, undreamed of by past ages, an earth totally exploited, controlled, and organized for the sake of man and against the true God. No place is secure from the encroaching empire of this nihilism. Everywhere, men feverishly pursue the work of, quote, progress, for what reason they do not know, or only very dimly sense. In the free world, it is perhaps abhor vacui that chiefly impels men into feverish activity that promises forgetfulness of the spiritual emptiness that attends all worldliness. In the communist world, a large role is still played by hatred against real and imagined enemies, but primarily against the god their revolution has dethroned a hatred that inspires them to remake the world against him. In either case, it is a cold, inhuman world that men without God are fashioning, a world where there are everywhere organization and efficiency, and nowhere love or reverence. The sterile, quote, purity and, quote, functionalism of contemporary architecture are a typical expression of such a world. The same spirit is present in the disease of total planning, for example in, quote, birth control, in experiments that look to the control of heredity and of the mind, in the, quote, welfare state. Some of the apologies for such schemes approach perilously near a strange kind of lucid insanity wherein precision of detail and technique are united to an appalling insensitivity to the inhuman end these schemes serve. Nihilist, quote, organization, the total transformation of the earth and society by machines, modern architecture and design, and the inhuman philosophy of, quote, human engineering that accompanies them, is a consequence of the unqualified acceptance of the industrialism and technology which we saw in the last chapter as bearers of a worldliness that, if unchecked, must end in tyranny. In it we may see a practical translation of the philosophical development we touched upon in section 1 above, the transformation of truth into power. What may seem, quote, harmless in philosophical pragmatism and skepticism becomes something else again in the, quote, planners of our own day. For if there is no truth, power knows no limit, save that imposed by the medium in which it functions or by a stronger power opposed to it. The power of contemporary, quote, planners will find its natural limit, if unopposed, only in a regime of total organization. Such, indeed, was the dream of Lenin, for before the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat comes to an end, quote, 
the whole of society will have become one office and one factory, with equal work and equal pay, end quote. In the nihilist, quote, new earth, all human energy is to be devoted to worldly concerns. The whole human environment and every object in it are to serve the cause of, quote, production, and to remind men that their only happiness lies in this world. There is to be established, in fact, the absolute despotism of worldliness. The artificial world erected by men who will to remove the last vestige of divine influence in the world and the last trace of faith in men promises to be so all-encompassing and so omnipresent that it will be all but impossible for men to see, to imagine, or even to hope for anything beyond it. This world, from the nihilist point of view, will be one perfect, quote, realism and total, quote, liberation. In actual fact, it will be the vastest and most efficient prison men have ever known. For, in the precise words of Lenin, quote, there will be no way of getting away from it. There will be nowhere to go, end quote. The power of the world, which nihilists trust as Christians trust their God, can never liberate. It can only enslave. In Christ alone, who has, quote, overcome the world, is there deliverance from that power, even when it shall have become all but absolute. 3. The Fashioning of the New Man The destruction of the old order, however, and the organization of the, quote, new earth, are not the only items in the historical program of nihilism. They are not, perhaps, even its most important items. They are but the preparation for a work more significant and more ominous than either, the, quote, transformation of man. This was the dream of the pseudo nietzscheans Hitler and Mussolini, of a, quote, higher humanity, to be forged through a, quote, creative violence. Quote, this is the mission of our century, said Hitler's propagandist Rosenberg, quote, out of a new life myth to create a new human type, end quote. We know from Nazi practice what this, quote, human type was, and the world would seem to have rejected it as brutal and inhuman. But the, quote, mass change in human nature, to which Marxism looks, is an end that perhaps is not very different. Marx and Engels are unequivocal on this subject. Both for the production on a mass scale of this communist consciousness, and for the success of the cause itself, the alteration of men on a mass scale is necessary, an alteration which can only take place in a practical movement, a revolution. This revolution is necessary, therefore, not only because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it can only in a revolution succeed in ridding itself of all the muck of ages and become fitted to found society anew. Putting aside for the moment the question of what kind of men are to be produced by this process, let us note carefully the means utilized. It is again violence, which is as necessary to the formation of the quote new man as it is to the building of a quote new earth. The two, indeed, are intimately connected in the determinist philosophy of Marx, for, quote, in revolutionary activity, change of self coincides with the change of circumstances, end quote. The change of circumstances, and more to the point, the process of changing them through revolutionary violence, transform the revolutionaries themselves. Here, Marx and Engels, like their contemporary Nietzsche, and like Lenin and Hitler after them, subscribe to the mystique of violence, seeing a magical change to be wrought in human nature through indulgence of the passions of anger, hatred, resentment, and the will to dominate.
In this regard, we must take note also of the two world wars, whose violence has helped to destroy forever the old order and the old humanity, rooted in a stable and traditional society, and has had a large role in producing the new uprooted humanity that Marxism idealizes. The 30 years of nihilist war and revolution between 1914 and 1945 have been an ideal breeding ground for the, quote, new human type. It is, of course, no secret to contemporary philosophers and psychologists that man himself is changing in our violent century, under the influence, of course, not only of war and revolution, but also of practically everything else that lay claim to being, quote, modern and, quote, progressive. We have already cited the most striking forms of nihilist vitalism, whose cumulative effect has been to uproot, disintegrate, and, quote, mobilize the individual, to substitute for his normal stability and rootedness a senseless quest for power and movement and to replace normal human feeling by a nervous excitability. The work of nihilist realism, in practice as in theory, has been parallel and complementary to that of vitalism, a work of standardization, specialization, simplification, mechanization, dehumanization. Its effect has been to, quote, reduce the individual to the most, quote, primitive and basic level, to make him, in fact, the slave of his environment, the perfect workman in Lenin's worldwide, quote, factory. These observations are commonplace today. A multitude of volumes has been written about them. Thinkers are able to see the clear connection between nihilist philosophy that reduces reality and humor to the simplest possible terms, and a nihilist practice that similarly reduces the concrete man. Not a few, also, realize the seriousness and the radicalness of this, quote, reduction, even to the extent of seeing in it, as does Eric Collar, a qualitative change in human nature. The powerful trend toward the disruption and invalidation of the individual manifestly present in the most diverse currents of modem life, economic, technological, political, scientific, educational, psychic, and artistic, appears so overwhelming that we are induced to see it in a true mutation, a transformation of human nature. But few even of those who realize this much have any real awareness of its profound significance and implications, for these are theological, and so completely outside the scope of any merely empirical analysis or of a possible remedy, for that must be of the spiritual order. The author just quoted, for example, draws hope from the prospect of a transition into, quote, some supra-individual form of existence, thus revealing that he has no higher wisdom than that of the, quote, spirit of the age, which indeed, as we shall see, has thrown up the ideal of a social, quote, superman. What, more realistic, is this, quote, mutation, the, quote, new man? He is the rootless man, discontinuous with the past that nihilism has destroyed, the raw material of every demagogue's dream, the, quote, free thinker and skeptic, closed only to the truth, but, quote, open to each new intellectual fashion because he himself has no intellectual foundation, the, quote, seeker after some, quote, new revelation, ready to believe anything new because true faith has been annihilated in him, the planner and experimenter, worshiping, quote, fact because he has abandoned truth, seeing the world as a vast laboratory in which he is free to determine what is, quote, possible, the autonomous man, pretending to the humility of only asking his, quote, rights, yet full of the pride that expects everything to be given him in a world where nothing is authoritatively forbidden, the man of the moment, 
without conscience or values, and thus at the mercy of the strongest, quote, stimulus. The, quote, rebel, hating all restraint and authority because he himself is his own and only God. The, quote, mass man, this new barbarian, thoroughly, quote, reduced and, quote, simplified, and capable of only the most elementary ideas, yet scornful of anyone who presumes to point out the higher things or the real complexity of life. These men are all one man, the man whose fashioning has been the very purpose of nihilism. But mere description cannot do justice to this man. One must see his image. And in fact, such an image has quite recently been portrayed. It is the image of contemporary painting and sculpture, that which has arisen, for the most part, since the end of the Second World War, as if to give form to the reality produced by the most concentrated era of nihilism in human history. The human form, it would seem, has been, quote, rediscovered in this art. Out of the chaos of total abstraction, identifiable shapes emerge. The result, supposedly, is a, quote, new humanism, a, quote, turn to man, that is all the more significant in that, unlike so many of the artistic schools of the 20th century, it is not an artificial contrivance whose substance is hidden behind a cloud of irrationalist jargon, but a spontaneous growth that would seem to have deep roots in the soul of contemporary man. In the work, for example, of Alberto Giamacchetti, Jean de Buffet, Francis Bacon, Leon Gulub, José Luis Cueva, to take an international sampling, there seems to be a genuinely, quote, contemporary art that, without abandoning the disorder and, quote, freedom of that abstraction, turns its attention away from mere escape towards a serious, quote, human commitment. But what kind of, quote, man is it to which this art has, quote, returned? It is certainly not Christian man, man in the image of God, for no, quote, modern man can believe in him, nor is it the somewhat diluted, quote, man of the old humanism, whom all, quote, advanced thinkers regard as discredited and outmoded. It is not even the, quote, man disfigured and denatured in the earlier, quote, cubist and expressionist art of this century. Rather, it begins where that art leaves off and attempts to enter a new realm, to depict a new man. To the orthodox Christian observer, concerned not with what the avant-garde finds fashionable or sophisticated, but with truth, little reflection should be required to penetrate to the secret of this art. There is no question of, quote, man in it at all. It is an art at once subhuman and demonic. It is not man who is the subject of this art, but some lower creature who has emerged, quote, arrived, is John Maketty's word for it, from unknown depths. The bodies this creature assumes, and in all its metamorphoses, it is always the same creature, are not necessarily distorted violently, Twisted and dismembered as they are, they are often more, quote, realistic than the figures of man in earlier modern art. This creature, it is clear, is not the victim of some violent attack. Rather, he was born deformed. He is a genuine, quote, mutation. One cannot but notice the likeness between some of these figures and photographs of the deformed children born recently to thousands of women who had taken the drug thalidomide during pregnancy, and we have doubtless not seen the last of such monstrous, quote, coincidences. Even more revealing than the bodies of these creatures are the faces. It would be too much to say that these faces express hopelessness, 
that would be to ascribe to them some trace of humanity which they most emphatically lack. They are the faces, rather, of creatures more or less, quote, adjusted to the world they know, a world not hostile, but entirely alien, not inhuman, but, quote, ahuman. The anguish and rage and despair of earlier expressionists is here frozen, as it were, and cut off from a world to which they had at least the relation of denial, so as to make a world of their own. Man, in this art, is no longer even a caricature of himself. He is no longer portrayed in the throes of spiritual death, ravaged by the hideous nihilism of our century that attacks not just the body and soul, but the very idea and nature of man. No, all this has passed. The crisis is over. Man is dead. The new art celebrates the birth of a new species, the creature of the lower depths, subhumanity. We have dealt with this art at a length perhaps disproportionate to its intrinsic value, because it offers concrete and unmistakable evidence for him who has eyes to see of a reality which, expressed abstractly, seems frankly incredible. It is easy to dismiss as fantasy the quote, new humanity foreseen by a Hitler or a Lenin, and even the plans of those quite respectable nihilists among us today who calmly discuss the scientific breeding of a quote, biological superman, or project a utopia for quote, new men to be developed by the narrowest quote, modern education and a strict control of the mind seem remote and only faintly ominous, but confronted with the actual image of a quote, new man, an image brutal and loathsome beyond imagination, and at the same time so unpremeditated, consistent, and widespread in contemporary art, one is caught up short. And the full horror of the contemporary state of man strikes one a blow one is not likely soon to forget. This concludes the reading of part six of Nihilism, the Root of the Revolution of the Modern Age by Eugene Father Seraphim Rose. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you, and God bless.